welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, this is James and welcome to the Madden America podcast. And before we get started today, I wanted to mention that Madden America's parent resources page is seeking blogs and personal stories from parents, their children and professionals about the unique challenges of caring for or being a youth with mental health challenges. Articles can run 500 to 2,000 words, and we encourage critical, creative, and alternative perspectives on diagnoses, drugs, family relations, school, the mental health system, and related issues. Please submit materials to our editor, Miranda Spencer, using the email address parents at maddenamerica.com, and you can visit the parent resources page at maddenamerica.com forward slash parents. So, on to our guest, and this week we continue our series of discussions with Lee Coleman, and in particular we talk about the need to break out of the circle and create a non-violent revolution. Lee, welcome. It's um, it's great to get to chat again for the podcast, and, you know, for people listening, I'd just like to relate that, that Lee and I met face-to-face recently in, uh, in a beautiful part of the UK, and you know, I was very fortunate to get to talk about some of the things that we've discussed on the podcast face to face, which was really nice. And Lee, we we kind of started the seed of a of an idea then about um perhaps a discussion about what people can do and how we might begin to respond to some of the issues that we've discussed already for the podcast, the power that psychiatry has, the fact that society enables psychiatry to wield this power and we don't question too much what it's doing. We also talked a bit about language and how that plays into that. So I thought it might be nice just to kind of get into that. So maybe first we, again, we started to talk a bit about how language assists psychiatry in, in the way that it's used and the way that people use it. So I wondered if you could help me understand a bit about the power of language in this. Yes, so important, James. In my writings already, and uh, I've done this from the very beginning of my work in psychiatry 50 years ago, language is that the core, not only of this problem with psychiatry, but of how we live you know, when you think about it, language is the one thing that human beings makes them so special, for better or for worse. Well, we're interested in mostly the worse <laughs> or these discussions because we've got some big problems to try to deal with. Language has the power to trigger off a whole chain of associations in our thinking, in our feelings, and in our behavior. But because it's so basic to our nature, we don't think about it. None of us, not a single one of us, can get your guard up so strong that every time a word comes in that you want to question or that you downright don't think is correct, you don't. You can't do it all the time. I try to do the best I can to back up my preaching about it, but I fail a lot of the time, all, all the time, every day. Because you can't pay attention to every word. You're going to let a lot of them slip through. So let's just pick an example. Let's say that we're talking about treatment. That's what doctors do. So if one particular branch of medicine, psychiatry, uses the word treatment and the listener or the reader doesn't adequately screen it and evaluate it, their assumption, their reaction, and potentially their behavior about that will be, this is a thing that is designed to correct something wrong in the body. That's what we think of as a treatment, like uh, treat cancer. We will also think that it is something that is done for the good of the person. Not for the doctor, not for society, but for the person who's going to get the treatment. So those would be, say, two examples. Well, in psychiatry, that is not true at all. Because of the role that psychiatry plays as society's enforcer, you might say, what psychiatrists do to people, unless it's with consent of the person, 
And it's informed consent, because you can't give real consent unless you've told the truth about what they want to do. What they call treatment will end up being quite, in many cases, torture. Now, I realize those are strong words, but I'm prepared to back them up. If you inflict something that is uncomfortable and and or painful and demeaning and I call soul destroying on somebody because you have the power of the state to enforce it, that's what I call torture. So when a psychiatrist talks about treatment, he's say drugs, and it all sounds so nice. Why wouldn't a doctor, isn't it okay? No, it can be torture if you're in an institution and you don't want it. If you're in an institution, they're going to give you shock treatment. That's torture. It's not treatment for the reasons I gave a few minutes ago. So words are so important. And in all my work, my writings, talking with you, I am always going to be urging people, practice, practice on getting better and better and better at evaluating those words as they come into you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you you know, you you gave a good example when we were talking together of you know the the fact that people throw around the terms antidepressants, antipsychotic, and anxiolytic drug. You know, they, these when you read about this, you find these terms were invented by pharmaceutical manufacturers long after the drugs had been created in the first place. But yet we we go along with psychiatry's view of the world, don't we? Yeah, that you know. Thanks for what a perfect. And next example, because those are words that were either deliberately or inadvertently designed, invented by psychiatry to promote its uh, effort to maintain its power, number one position in the mental health field. And again, those are all the kind of lies, the kind of deceptions, maybe self-deception, but either way, it's untruths. Because, first of all, none of those drugs are treatments in the sense of what I talked about just a minute ago. There's no known medical abnormality to treat. There's no way to measure how the vast majority of people, whether they're getting better, because even that is subjective to what are the pressures on somebody to say what somebody wants them to say, or whether they'll get out of an institution if they say the right thing, sweet talk the doctor. So talking about something as an antidepressant, there's no evidence that they are antidepressants. As you said, they, those names were invented so you could say, well, I treat a specific disorder. Well, the fact is there aren't any boundaries between specific disorders in psychiatry like there are legitimate boundaries in real medicine. There's a difference between, let's say, uh, chest pain that is caused by a heart attack versus chest pain caused by somebody sticking a knife between your ribs. You use different kinds of information, and you separate out one kind of cause from another cause. That's what you do in real medicine. But in psychiatry, symptoms and causes are not separable except by non-medical investigation using your common sense and your experience. And that's what we need instead of what psychiatry is promoting. So uh, all these terms that psychiatry has created are all deceptions in order to maintain its pseudo-medical front. And clarity of thought is the only way we will ever get past that. I believe that even the best of the critical psychiatry movement, who I respect immensely, people like Bob Whitaker, Peter Gutchin, while I totally respect the groundbreaking, courageous work of people like that, and there are others as well, I believe that they're all missing the point on something very, very important, and that is the real issues, as you can hear, are language, which you just brought up, and we haven't got to yet, but I want to get to the issues of force and the law. 
Now, those are ethical issues. They're not scientific questions. So what we want to do, what we want to urge on the population is at the bottom line, most important is pay attention to the language and recognize that the audience should not be just a group of scientists who are going to decide what is the evidence. It's a matter of ethics. Have we forced something on somebody? And is what we've done to them something which we cannot know is actually treatment because there are specific disorders? Those are the fundamental questions that we always have to keep getting back to. Yeah, absolutely. We'll come on to those shortly, but I wanted to go back to something you said earlier. You talked about treatments and being torture in some circumstances, and it is a strong word, but I can completely see why it's justified. But, you know, I have met psychiatrists who seem to me perfectly reasonable people, and yet they are complicit in these supposed treatments which harm people or have the potential to harm people. So how can we reconcile the fact that perfectly good people are involved in activities which could be harming people that are, are called their patients? You know, how can that be? You know, I have difficulty squaring the circle on that. Well, yeah, I think, again, that's very good because so many people are, who maybe aren't as familiar or steeped in the issues like you and I and many others, I think, again, history is a, is a good way to understand it because is there any one of us who's ever lived on this earth who is not a product of their time, a product of their culture, a product of their inheritance? We all are caught in traps. I think of them as a circle. You can move to the edge of the circle if you're a daring and a well-read and a thoughtful person, but you can never get completely outside the circle because history and your culture hem you in. So you just try to do the best you can. Okay, let's take the issue of slavery. Now, how many, the, the vast majority of people in the countries that practice slavery, and England, more than any other country, started it, quickly the United States and France and other places, in all those societies, the vast, vast majority of people truly believed it was the reasonable way to go. And they had, a, they had been taught from, from childhood, this is the way it's intended. The strongest survived. There was even, of course, the Darwinian uh, support for this kind of argument. It's nature's way. So we really shouldn't blame people who are caught in that idea of, hey, as a doctor, I, I know what's better for you than you do because I'm a doctor and so forth and so on. And I even agree with society's demand that I do this to you because I care about you. Ultimately, that's why I don't blame the psychiatrists, and I talk about this a lot in my YouTube regularly. Ultimately, while we're going to hold people responsible because they live in the society, we have to hold them responsible. Ultimately, who's to blame is all of us, every one of us, you, me, and everybody, because we are in the society that demands of psychiatrists that they do that. And if they don't do it, in almost all cases, they will lose their job. Now, think about it. I am in a luxurious position of being retired, so I don't have to make any money. I don't lose anything from whatever I want to say here. Very few people can say that who are in the mental health profession. So the key thing is don't put the most blame on practicing psychiatrists. Take it on yourself to say, society not only allows psychiatrists to do these things, but actually demands it of them and says, if you don't do it, you're going to lose your job. Now, can we expect people to overcome that? No. Only a political movement, a revolution, a nonviolent revolution is the only way. And that's really what I try to do is to. It'll never work in today's world, but maybe 200 years from now, if we create a record, maybe the time will come. But I think that's what has to be our emphasis is taking responsibility, every one of us, ourself, and then saying, okay, I've got a busy life. I've got a lot of things to take care of. I've got my kids and my mortgage, but can I give it some time? 
and money. I won't get any of it. I don't want any of it. But the movement needs the money. And I can tell you, without money, all the rest is wasted breath. So then, you know, the big question, Lee, that all this leads to, of course, is how does society respond to a problem that it largely doesn't know that it has, that only a few people are really talking about in earnest? And if we want change in 10 years' time, 20 years' time, how long it might take, what foundations do we need to build now? How do we put those foundations in place to enable society to see past the damage that is being done? Well, I think the first thing to do is, again, go to history and recognize just how huge the problem is, because you're going to be asking yourself, well, how do we begin? We'll begin what? How big is the problem we have to begin on? So my latest writings are focusing on talking about the impact of technology in psychiatry, a a new partnership where every being on the earth is about to be trackable. The forces that psychiatry is linking up with know where you are and can define whatever it wants to define and say, you need drugs. You need to be incarcerated because our machine intelligence tells us you do. And here's a diagnostic label to prove it, all of which is fraudulent. So we have to recognize just how big that problem is. So your question is, how do we begin? I have done a lot of thinking about that. And I'm going to be fortunate to have a space for a workshop at the NARPA and Mind Freedom Meeting in Connecticut later this fall. I hope somebody who's listening, free up your schedule and come on by and join us. Money is number one. Because the other side has unlimited funds. I have no idea how many hundreds of billions of dollars. How much money is controlled by Facebook, Google, Microsoft, and then all the other tech giants which are rushing to get on the bandwagon. I can't even begin to calculate how much wealth there is. We have zero. We have none. How can we do something that will attract some money? Because there is money out there. Now, you know, my, in my, my experience, the only major media outlet that could help us, because besides money, we then need an educational effort, is Al Jazeera. So what I want to say is, for goodness sake, all you people out there, do not as I know some of my closest colleagues have done, up to this point, reject Al Jazeera because they think, oh, Muslim, terrorist, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm a regular listener to Al Jazeera English, and I can tell you that is not what those people are all about. They have the biggest heart. They demonstrate the most intelligence and the most dedication to giving the stories about how ordinary people are being screwed, tortured, demeaned, bludgeoned in every possible way by the United States and all the forces that are linked to it. So we start off, in my view, first of all, by figuring out ways to raise money for spending on the right causes. And I think the right next thing, where do we spend the money? Public education. You notice I didn't say training medical students. I didn't say training academics. I didn't say training ex-patients so we have a vibrant critical psychiatry movement. I say all of it. All those people have their legitimate place in a political movement And by all of it, I mean the general public. I don't care if you didn't even graduate high school. There's a place for you. I don't care if you were, you've been in mental hospitals with psychotic breakdowns 20 times. I don't care whether you're a psychiatrist who's been drugging people, but you're ready to stop. All those people are the allies that we need if they are ready to understand what's going on and contribute to the network. Okay. If we get the money, 
And I think, say, as I said, I think Al Jazeera is the number one place where if it were up to me, I'd have a plane ticket to Doha and I'd ask to talk to the closest person who they let me talk to, who's the emir, who's a, I don't know the guy, but he's doing fantastic work in public education. Then what we would do with that money is we would begin to have conferences with taking some of that money. And some of the conferences would be the kind of thing that I have the privilege of speaking to in Connecticut that I just mentioned. That will be for people already in the critical psychiatry movement, whether they're ex-patients, sympathetic and supportive psychiatrists like myself, and all in between. Then we would have media conferences where we get media who haven't seen it yet or who are profiting by supporting the wrong side. If it's not too far afield, I'd like to talk about that next and, and tell you how all the major media, just about with, no, with almost no exceptions, is not only ignoring us, but is jumped on the bandwagon with the very people who present this worldwide threat. Yeah, I think that's a really good time to go on to talk about the media, because I think, again, you and I, went, when we met, talked a little bit about this. And I know in the UK that the media are kind of, again, complicit in this story that people that struggle with serious mental health concerns might be dangerous. They, they make people frightened of mental health concerns. And then secondly, they never adopt a critical perspective or tone. So they write it all as if it's fact. And of course, then, you know, people believe that. But actually, I've seen a good amount of discussion and debate on Facebook where members of the public are much more savvy and actually say it's life circumstances that cause this person to struggle. It's difficult upbringing or whatever else. So there's, there's a gulf there between what the media are portraying and what people are discussing in private. But then, of course, you hear don't ever get medical advice from Facebook or, or the like. So uh, how, how, do, how do we challenge this media being complicit with the world of the medical model and you know, not, not challenging it critically? Well, again, we have to start with understanding why do they think that way? Why are they reacting that way? And boy, if it, it is, I have seen it so true. People on Facebook are way ahead of the experts. I mean, I can't believe the, the biggest psychiatrists doing the worst things with the longest list of degrees are the liars, the ones who are telling things that they should know better. And the people on Facebook, by and large, are way ahead. They get it. And we just have to help them get it in a more sophisticated way. So why is it happening? Money. Let me give you an example. And boy, I'm looking forward to telling you this. I live in the San Francisco Bay Area. Berkeley is right across from San Francisco. So our local public media is KQED. KQED is a major branch of PBS. And until recently, their number one moneymaker, the guy that I would see over and over again to my disgust, so much so that I told him several years ago, I'm, I had been a member of KQED for 40 years. I said, I'm no longer a member. And I won't come back until you get rid of Dr. Daniel Amen. Dr. Daniel Amen would be on there every time they would have fundraisers. They were giving him hour after hour. I mean, it's unbelievable how much free time. He was speaking to rapt audiences so enthralled as he would show his slides of brain scans, SPECT scans of particular kind, not as deadly as ionizing radiation like for an x-ray, but still significant and not something you want to put in somebody's brain when there's nothing wrong with their brain, which is the truth. He was the number one moneymaker for KQED. And of course, that was spread around to other outlets and they would make money. So he was making huge amounts of money. He now has multiple clinics until he finally got taken off. I don't seem to see him anymore. You know why? <laughs> Not for the right reasons. 
because he got trashed by somebody who's even worse. Psychiatrist Jeffrey Lieberman, the most dangerous psychiatrist in the world. So those are the kind of people who the media is beholden to because they have all the money. So I want to say right now, because our efforts, yours and mine, and everybody in between, Goethe, Whitaker, fantastic people, every one of them, and many, many more, really amount to squeaks. Squeaks meaning nobody's giving us any attention or even trashing us. Look at what the New Yorker did to Whitaker in their article about Laura Delano. By the way, one of the finest, most dedicated, critical psychiatry people. She could be, in my view, absolutely number one for people who inspire me. So I hereby challenge Jeffrey Lieberman to debate me in an open forum. I can personally guarantee you he's not going to respond, and my verbalizations here will just be another squeak. But if we have a public education campaign where people start to get it, then maybe it won't be a squeak because maybe then they'll be able to put so many demands on him and the American Psychiatric Association, which he was past president of, to say, listen, if you don't debate Dr. Coleman, then you're just chicken. So you better do it or you're going to have protesters on the street in front of the next APA meeting etc cetera, etc cetera. so that's the program money education public education i'm all for educating scientists and getting what they call evidence based medicine but that's not where it's at it's language it's common sense it's ethics and it's the lack of force all things we've talked about that's the program I would outline. That's what I've been talking about. I'm going to keep talking about it. And uh, it won't mean a damn thing if you people out there are listening. Don't tell your friends. Otherwise, it's just one more squeak. Thank you. And, and I, I also wondered about, I, I know personally that, that in the UK, campaigners have had a little bit of success when they've come to challenge conflicts of interest. So, you know, not mentioning any names, but challenging senior psychiatrists who list conflicts of interest statements that are so long and involve so many pharmaceutical companies, when challenged on that, they get quite defensive and quite uncomfortable. And I think it's it's quite easy to make the link for people that maybe these psychiatrists speaking out are not impartial medical professionals that we'd like them to be, but they're actually paid to give a certain message in a certain way. So, you know, I, I wondered how, you know, conflict of interest was seen in, in the U.S. side of things. Well, it's, it's the same. I think that uh, the U.S. and the other places are, they have a little uh, escape mechanism, psychiatry does, and medicine too, but not nearly as bad, for, for rationalizing the way around that issue. In the beginning maybe 20 years ago, people were nervous in the field to say, oh, yeah, you know, I did accept some money from this drug company, and I did allow them to ghostwrite my article, and I, I was willing to sign off on it, and all that kind of ugly stuff that is just so unethical. And so the psychiatric says, yeah, yeah, we, you know, we're a bunch of ethical scientific guys, and we, we, we don't like that. So now you have to disclose. Well, they found so many people were disclosing, they couldn't find anybody on any review committees or any panels who didn't have so many conflicts. So what did they come up with? They said, well, of course, that's not a good idea. Uh, if you have a conflict, and not many other people do, that you might be one of the bad apples in the barrel. But if everybody's doing it, it must be okay. So." Conflict is not a problem because it's standard practice. And you can, just because you get these perks doesn't mean that your opinion should be suspect. In other words, if everybody's doing it, it must be okay. And you have to admit, psychiatry has been pretty clever at rationalizing the way around it. But the fact remains, it should be illegal 
it should be punishable, at least civilly. And who knows, maybe criminally, if you could show that deaths resulted. And we know that psychiatric drugs lead to death. They lead to shortening of lives. They lead to compromised lives. You can tell us about that from your firsthand experience. So, yeah, the conflict of interest is something where, again, unless we get to the bottom line of what's happening, why it's happening, the language issues, we will allow them to make it look like they're making progress. But in fact, there has been no progress. Some of the ways we would get around it is number one, recognizing that psychiatry is not scientific. It doesn't mean you shouldn't have training. Professionalism doesn't have to be scientific. I think that um, we can get around the issue of conflict, but only through the kind of fundamental thinking that we're, we've been talking about. Yeah, absolutely. And and so, you know, Lee, I've I've witnessed in conversations on Facebook, there's a sense of moral outrage there that more people out in society don't know about what's happening when people are coerced and forced drugged and, and all the rest of it. So I just wondered if you have any advice for people listening that do feel morally outraged about that. What What should they do about that? What can they do? Okay, I think what they have to do is, number one, look into their heart and their mind. You can't do it without both. You And then ask yourself, not only what do I think based on my opinion. In fact, let me just back up. In my YouTube videos, I say to people over and over again, I don't want you to believe me what I'm saying about psychiatry because of that word belief. If you decide, I believe Dr. Coleman, that means you're deciding you don't believe Dr. Lieberman. I don't want you to do either one because more likely than not, more people will believe Lieberman than Lee Coleman. He's well known. I'm just starting out in this game. I've been working in these areas for 50 years longer than he has. I'm about 10 years older. But in terms of influence, money, power, my career didn't take me to be president of the American Psychiatric Association. Thank heaven for that. So basically, you have to ask yourself, who am I going to believe? And the answer is believe yourself. So what I say to people is take what I say and run it through your experience and your intelligence and your heart and ask, is this Which do I find more believable? What Coleman is saying or what Lieberman is saying? And I am confident that I will win that battle. So decide what you believe, what you think is wrong with society and with psychiatry. Remember, it's society also. And then ask yourself, what can I truly do about it? Now, I'm not asking people, and I don't want people to fall apart in the rest of their life. You have children to raise, maybe. You certainly have family that you may feel is more important than anything else. You may have, you may be a prisoner in prison and you need to get out to do anything else. There may be somebody lying in the street and you have to give them your attention. So the point is, decide with your heart and your mind, what can't I give? And then, If you have something to give, how am I going to do it? The way to do it is to get educated. You must understand the nature of the problem if you hope to do any good. That is what is so wrong, so terribly wrong with psychiatry. They don't understand the problem. They want to treat it like a disease. You cannot treat human, emotional, and behavioral problems, pain, as a disease, because rarely does it have anything to do with disease. Yes, there are a few medical conditions which can upset you emotionally. We know that. But the vast, vast majority have nothing to do with disease. So you must understand the nature of the problem, and that requires a lot of study. I've been doing this for 50 years, or actually 60 years, you include medical school, college, even more. So study, start to study. But on the other hand, you don't have to know 
you don't have to be Leonardo da Vinci. You just have to know, hey, it's wrong to lock somebody up in a building that they call a hospital, but which is, in fact, a prison, and do things to them they call treatment, which, in fact, are tortures. Do you have to know much to know that? No, you just have to be a human being who thinks about it. And then get involved. Get involved. Join one of the support groups. Volunteer somewhere. Write an article. I'll tell you, from a selfish or narrow personal point of view, what I would say is tune in to my YouTube videos. I frankly am immodestly don't believe there's a better source to understand because it's broader than most of the other things you read about or watch. There's a lot of good ones, but I don't know of any that talk about social background as, as well as psychiatry, that talk about legal and ethical questions and historical side of it, all of it. So I would say, Go to all those sources. It's not a me versus anybody else. Go to Peter Goetje. Go to Bob Whitaker. Go to Peter Bregan. Go to Laura Delano. I, as I said, if I had to pick one, Laura Delano would be number one to have everything, intellect, emotion. She has the experience of being through it and her ability to express it. So... That's my recommendations for what you can do about it. That's, that's really powerful and really helpful, Lee. Thank you. And, and also, you know, it reminds me that, you know, language is, is important too, isn't it? That it's too easy to be complicit in the language of psychiatry without really realizing it. And we ought to try and take back some of those terms for ourselves. Yeah, you know, I would say here would be a good one. And I want to give all you listeners out there, Start keeping a diary or a notebook. Every time you hear somebody or you read a word being used, and there's a linguist at UC Berkeley, uh, Robin Lakoff and her husband, George Lakoff, the power of words, the misuse of words. Keep a diary or a notebook every time you run across a word that you can sense and feel and know is a misuse and when, as you keep it, will you send me a copy? James can tell you how to get it to me because I'm doing it myself, but there's no way we're gonna, not going to miss some, and I don't want to miss any of them. But that would be, in my opinion, probably the most powerful thing you could do because every time you talk to a friend, every time you write something yourself, catch them up. I've done it to you, James. I've caught you, and you caught me. So let's keep doing that. Yeah, it, it is so easily done, isn't it? It is so easily done to use terms that we have read in the media, only have a slightest understanding of, and, and yet we discuss them as if they're legitimate, valid, uh, science-based facts. But actually, you know yourself, and Shirley, and many others, when you, when you start to look at what underpins some of these terms, you find there's really very little. Well, you know, if you think about it, and you think about what are we as human beings? What's this material made up of? Language is the thing that separates us from all other animals. And how do we learn the way, the fantastic, unimaginable way that little children, one year old, even in utero, and then with, you know, one year, one and a half, two years old, sucking in all this knowledge without any intellectual understanding, without any background, and they become these marvelous machines. They do it by learning and suggestibility. They, the most powerful kind of learning is taking place because they have no intellectual basis to categorize. Or, but at the same token, they are an unthinking learning mechanism. So intuitively, we accept what is brought to us because as an infant, we're not intelligent enough to say, I accept this, I don't accept that. So human beings are this amazing creature for absorbing. But by the same token, the darker side is whatever is put into us 
becomes who we are so deep, how can you ever unravel it? Well, it's that's why our job is difficult, but we have to try. We have to do the best we can at saying, even though those powerful forces are making us so suggestible, we have to try to resist it because a lot of people's welfare is depending on us to try our best to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, Lee, for giving us all some practical examples of things that we can do, you know, from the simplest things of challenging our language and the language of others to contributing to good causes and, and you know, educating and attending events. So there are many things. So thank you for helping yeah, give yeah. people examples of how they can contribute to this. Well, I just want to say, James, thank you. And I want to just make sure the listeners recognize that just because I'm doing all the talking or almost all the talking, James is at least an equal partner in this because remember, if I didn't have James to get me out there to all of you, I would just be nothing more than a little squeak from Berkeley. It would make no difference whatever without the kind of people who can link it up to people throughout the world. We got a tough job even with that, but we have no chance whatsoever if we don't have people like you to have the technical background and have the dedication to make it happen. So to me, it's nothing but a privilege to work with you. Oh, well, likewise, Lee. And, you know, I see my role and the role of many others is to amplify all those squeaks until they cannot be ignored anymore. Okay, brother, I'm with you for that. See you later. Well, I'd like to thank Lee for taking the time to chat. And you can find links to Lee's articles and his YouTube videos by visiting the post that accompanies this interview on Madden America. And if you want to get in touch to give us feedback or with a message for Lee, then please email podcasts at maddenamerica.com. So thank you so much for listening. And until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views and updates. 